Let me begin this way. It's the end of the world, and you know it. It's the end of the world, I've got to show it. It's the end of the world, so go out and play it again. May 21st. The end of the world and the beginning of a new life, graduates. It's interesting the term graduate, to graduate, to move forward. I've got some, I hope, important thoughts about that, and I'd like to start with why this day is so profoundly significant for me. In 1969, I had left Providence College two years earlier, a Catholic college in Boston, a small school, much like this, and gone to Harvard. Why? Because she was tall and blonde and beautiful. <laughs> it was the stupidest decision I ever made. And on May 26th, 1969, my friends graduated from Providence College, the guys that I had loved. The fact that you have honored me, President Brophy, with this marvelous doctorate means more than I can possibly express. I'm 64, and when you get to this stage of life, you begin to look at it and recognize that each day ought to be a graduation, an improvement, a growth, a process of hope, of change, of unlimited possibilities. Here is what I believe. I was born blind and many people would consider that a disability. I've learned to understand that it's an ability because I've been given special gifts. There is not a human being in this room who has not been given special gifts. In my case, I've never met an ugly person unless they wanted to be. <laughs> I dated a few, but uh, other than that. But, and I've enjoyed a world of senses that most humans will never take the time to appreciate. We were talking today about how on a clear day all of you can stand up here on this campus and look out at Catalina and the surrounding area, sometimes all the way to Santa Monica. The ability to look beyond yourselves, to look outside yourselves, is the miracle of what it is to be sighted. But what I'm hoping for you is that you learn to look at life not outside in, but inside out. Think about this. Think about this. Up until the creation of the automobile, we moved by horse or by the ability of men and women to pull things they needed over land. When the Declaration of Independence was signed, it took John Adams two weeks to ride by horseback from Boston to Philadelphia. Now, in the world you live in, revolutions occur through Facebook. <laughs> and the process of knowledge is instant. I, I, I got into this argument with my son and daughter recently because I said, when have you read your last book? And they said, dude, why do we have to read it if we can look it up? And it's, it, my daughter has this horrible habit when I tell what I consider to be an Irish story that may have a few lies in it, she looks up the information while I'm telling the story and says, no, Dad, that's not it. So the world is moving faster than any of us could conceive. And, 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 and throughout history, scholars and poets and teachers have written about it. Wordsworth, another favorite poet of mine, wrote, wrote about a world that he viewed as, as confusing. The world is here of late, he said. Getting and spending, we lay waste our power. Little we see in nature that's ours. We've given our hearts away a sordid boon, the sea that bears her bosom to the moon. The wind that howls at all hours, our gathering fall of spring flowers. For this, for everything, we're out of tune and it moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed outworn, so might I, while standing on this pleasant weed, 
had a sight that would make me less forlorn. To see old Proteus rise from the sea or hear old Triton blow his rhythmed horn, the world is too much with us late and soon. Is it? Sometimes as a person at my stage of life, I think so. One of the things that bothers me tremendously about the direction so many young people are taking is that we have become, I think, a society of entitlement. We say, what are they going to do about the problem? We say, it's up to them to make decisions. We say, how could they possibly decide to choose a course of action like that? But young men and women, they are us. We are them. And as you graduate from here, and if we agree that graduation is not just a single moment, but a process that's ongoing, many of you will choose to stay on this beautiful campus. Some of you will leave. Some of you may choose not to continue this process of education, but to go out into the world and make a living. I get all that. But there is a value system that's been taught here. When Sister stood up and spoke and talked of her 40 years as a teacher, how moving is that? To give her life to God and to education. Am I suggesting you do that? No, not necessarily. But I am suggesting that you choose to live your lives selflessly rather than selfishly. I learned a lot about this. Because as a little boy, I was a very angry child. See, I had been blind, and I had gone to a school for the blind, and in that school, I'd been the best at everything. Best singer, best actor, best athlete, best student. But on the weekends, when I'd come home to my neighborhood in Boston, I was the kid nobody could play with. And I thought, how the hell do you win? I mean, if I'm the best at being blind, but I'm the worst at being sighted, how do I find my place in life? I felt sorry for myself. I had a teacher, an African-American guy named Hank Santos, who was my piano teacher. Hank understood that I didn't want to play Chopin and, and Bach. He knew I wanted to play jazz, and he had won the Van Cliburn competition in the Soviet Union, but had also been in the Air Force, where he had played jazz with the Air Force Band. And when I'd come for my lessons, he would allow me to sing Billie Holiday and Duke Ellington and Ella. And one night he said to me, Tom, I want you to come to my home. I've got some friends coming in, and I'd like you to sing for them. So I did. And at the end, this man walked up to me and said, young man, my friend Hank tells me you're a pretty angry kid. Why is that? And I mouthed off about it. And I said, you know, I felt like I'd been cheated because I was blind, and I was the best at being blind, but I sucked at being sighted, and nobody would play with me. And I lived life on the outside. I wasn't an insider. And I felt really sorry for myself. And he said, oh. He said, well, why don't you learn to teach others about who you are? Why don't you learn to reach outside yourself and find your better character and mean it and spread that message to others? Why don't you do that, he said. Why don't you drop your own sense of prejudice, he said. And then he said, my name is Dr. Martin Luther King, 